To the cost of living pressures, which is the focus of the first question, uh, that's the thing that constituents are talking to me about in South Australia, and particularly through phone canvassing and surveys and responses that we're getting from people. And I'd just like to draw the Senate's attention to some reporting in The Australian this week concerning uh, the GenCost report and CSIRO and the admission by CSIRO and their chief energy economist, which highlighted that the GenCost report, in making the claim which is often referred to by Minister Bowen and by advocates for variable renewable energy that wind and solar are the cheapest forms of power, that the CSIRO has now confirmed that the GenCost report does not take into account all of the associated and consequential costs in terms of firming and the overbuilding of transmission lines, etc., for those distributed systems to work. Now, what that means is that the work of experts such as the OECD and the IEA, who issued a report in April last year uh, showing, for those who are interested, I think it was page 35 in the report, they show through good, solid economic and engineering analysis that without taking into account those systems costs, you cannot fully understand a comparison of different ways to supply energy. And that, in fact, what the OECD and IEA found is that a reliance on a high penetration of variable renewable energy, such as wind and solar, in fact drives prices up as a nation seeks to constrain carbon emissions. And the graph that's the, the, if you like, the pinnacle of their analysis shows very clearly that as we move beyond 2030 towards net zero in 2050, that the cost of achieving that, in fact they claim it is probably unachievable, relying on wind and solar, uh, and that the cost will become unaffordable. And we see that lived experience in countries such as Germany, who have probably the highest penetration in the OECD of wind and solar. They also have the highest prices. And if the rhetoric was correct, a high penetration of wind and solar would be driving their prices down. But that is not the case. What the OECD and IEA clearly show is that you need a firming supply of power, which is either hydro, particularly if you have fast-flowing rivers, uh, or nuclear energy as the other option, which is zero emission and, despite the uh, assertions, is actually not the most expensive form of power. And that report shows very clearly, in a comparison of both levelised costs, that long-run nuclear plants are actually cheaper than many forms of variable energy. And by the time you take into account the systems costs, including transmission and firming, they are cheaper. And that is why, as we look around uh, the world, both in the United States and in Europe and in the Indo-Pacific regions, we see nations investing again in nuclear power because they recognise that to reduce emissions and have affordable power, we need to make that change. That's why Canada, particularly the province of Ontario with 19 reactors, has the cheapest power in the OECD. Uh, the combination of, as a nation, hydro, but in Ontario particularly the 19 reactors, it actually drives the price down for both business and consumers. And that's why the coalition is calling for a sensible discussion about removing the prohibitions on nuclear power here so that our agencies such as the CSIRO and industry can do the detailed economic and engineering analysis to demonstrate once and for all that it is a viable option and then we allow the market to actually make those decisions. That's the positive agenda of the coalition, to reduce prices for Australian households and for businesses which guarantees not only lower emissions but jobs and affordability into the future.